Have you ever had a hobby that you really enjoyed at some point in your life, but then you kind of grew bored of it, kind of grew out of it? But every time that you meet someone that's really passionate about it, you want to start it again. So when I was younger, um, when I was a student, I had a saltwater aquarium. It is amazing. Like, the reefs are right there in your room, right? But it is an intense hobby. It takes so much time, so much money, and um, I loved it. I spent... I was a student. That's the best days of your life. I worked and I was a student. So I lived with my mom. She was my, washed my clothes. She made me food. I earned a salary and I spent it on the fish. <laughs> that was it, right? <laughs> and, um, but, but then I got older and, and I got married. So the saltwater aquarium had to go. But every time we visit an aquarium, Yolanda is like, oh, now you will want a saltwater aquarium again. And I'm like... Yes, that's true, I know it, like, and every time I see this fish, I'm like, maybe just a small one, no? But then I read again that a small one is more worksome than, like, maybe a big one. But it's interesting how it works, how we can be passionate about one thing today and then tomorrow lose our passion for it, and when someone shows it what it, it means to be passionate about this thing, then suddenly we're passionate about it again. And we are talking about revival, about God sending revival to transform life, to transform a church, to breathe, as we just sang, life into bones, to bring armies out of bones. And since I first heard about revival, one of the most constant questions I've always asked is, why can't times of revival just last forever? Why couldn't after the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, why couldn't the church just grab a hold of this, run with it, and... For the next thousands of years till Jesus returns, we can just see the church living in the power that God wants us to live in, making the difference that he wants us to make. But I think often we do with our faith the same thing that what, what I have done with my saltwater aquarium, right? We go through these phases where we're super excited about God and we're all passionate about Him and we want to talk to everyone about Him and, and we're on fire for Him and then we kind of get used to God and instead of developing a steady relationship with, with God, I get bored of God and I kind of put Him in the back burner and I go, get focused on all kinds of other stuff and it moves to the back of my mind. And I think that is why God sends, might be one of the reasons why God sends revival because the apathetic state of the church, of the living God, has always been a concern for me. And it continues to really be a concern for me. And every time when I see these flickerings of revival and throughout my life I've seen them and I'm like, oh, this might be it. Every time I see that it gives me enough hope to continue despite the fact that I'm, I'm not unaware of the challenges that we face in the church. And today, for the third part of the series, we already heard what the characteristics of revival is. What is revival? We said it's a return to Pentecost. We've looked at some of the characteristics that should be part of a revival to be an actual revival instead of just a church doing an evangelistic meeting. We already spoke last week. Our second topic, what was that? Wait, wait, wait. Now I've got a blank moment here. Huh? When? When? Thank you, Anna. Such a blank moment. Last week we spoke about when, right? When the church is really in need of God to turn it around, when we have our burden for revival and we start praying for it, then God sends revival. And today our third topic in this series is why does God send revival? Why does God send revival? And we are going back to the text that we read last week, that we read last week. What we're going to go to the beginning of the part that we read. So first, I want to give you a bit of background again. If you were here last week, you, you would know a little bit about this. But 
Acts 2, we read about the first week, the Holy Spirit was poured out. There was no more separation between us and God since the Holy Spirit was poured out. And then something interesting happens. The church actually starts living as the church. And one of the moments when they lived as the church was when Peter and John walked past the lame man that was lame for 40 years and he's a beggar. That was his identity. It was All he had left was that I am worthy of nothing because back in those days you weren't worth anything if you had a disability. So he was sitting outside the temple just begging for money and Peter tells him, I can't give you money but what I can give you is in the name of Jesus, stand up and walk. This man gets up and he starts walking. But this in such such a spiral of, of excitement through the nation that the religious leaders arrested Peter and John, and they're like, you can't talk about this Jesus anymore. Like, this is going to go south for the religious leaders, right? So they're trying to prevent them from talking to people about Jesus. And what we're going to do today is we're going to read, <clears throat> last week we read some of the, the um, trial that happened and then the prayer of the church. Today we're going to read a bigger piece of the trial that happened because I think in it we will see something of why God wants to send revival. And we'll be reading, if you've got your Bibles with you, Acts. Acts is the fourth book in the New Testament. It was written by Luke. He wrote one of the Gospels, the story that we remember the life of Jesus in. And then Acts is the, the history book of the early church. So Acts 4, it will also be on the screen, verse 13 to 22. Okay, so now the religious leaders... They're doing this whole trial, told Peter and John, you're not allowed to talk about Jesus anymore. And they're like, they just keep sharing Jesus with these religious leaders. So then verse 13, when they, when the religious leaders saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, remember the religious leaders were schooled. By the age of 12, they knew the first five books of the Bible basically by heart. And now they're talking to a bunch of fishermen and unschooled people, and it's like these guys are actually teaching us what's going on. When they realized, they were astonished, and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Something was different in their lives. But since they could see the man who had been healed standing there with them, there was nothing they could say. They couldn't refute the claim, right, that, that God is working through these people. So they ordered Peter and John to withdraw from the Sanhedrin and then confer together. What are we going to do with these men, they asked. Everyone living in Jerusalem knows that they have performed a notable sign, and we cannot deny it. But to stop this thing from spreading any further amongst the people, we must warn them to speak no longer to anyone in his name. Then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, Which is right in God's eyes? To listen to you or to him. You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. And after further threats, they let them go. And they could not decide how to punish them because all the people were praising God for what had happened. For the man who was miraculously healed was over 40 years old. That's what we're going to read today. Selwyn Hughes, in the book Revival, Times of Refreshing, mentions three purposes of why God would send revival to His church. And I said this in previous weeks as well. If you're not a Christian, you might feel like this is a little bit over your top, but this is a family conversation, right? But this will show you something of who God is and what God is about and what He wants to see happen in His church. And if you are a Christian and you are part of the church, I hope that this really challenges you to say, like, where we are at is not enough. But Selwyn Hughes mentions three purposes for why God sends revival, and I'm going to talk through those three from this text, but we're going to start at the beginning of this text and work our way, um, or at the end of it, and work our way towards the beginning of what we just read. Now, the religious leaders, they they are angry and they are upset, right? Because this Jesus that they just crucified, his good news, the story about this Jesus is spreading like wildfire, through the Jewish community, and they need to stop this immediately. 
But they can't punish. They're in a catch-22. Because on the one hand side, they're like, we need to cut this off before it spreads any further. On the other hand side, they're like, we can't really do anything because the people are so excited about what's happening. If we kill Peter and John, they will go and revolt and we will have one of the biggest rebellions that we've ever seen on our hands. So they don't know what to do. Everyone we read in verse 21 was praising God. So the first reason why I believe God sends revival is to bring glory to His name. Because I've often thought about, like, wouldn't it be great if God could use me like He used some of the preachers and some of the people that He's used to the art revival since the day of Pentecost? Wouldn't it be great to be one of those, like, one of the names written down in a book that goes through, through history and people read about you, right? Wouldn't that be awesome? I'm like, yes, I think we all feel that would be awesome. But often we long for revival for the sake of ourselves. We long for revival because I want to be used by God in a powerful way. Or I'm tired of the state of the church, the apathetic state of the church. I'm tired of nominal Christians. I just want to, want to see God working through me and through others in powerful ways. But what is interesting about the story is Peter and John, when God decided to heal that lame man that has been lame for 40 years, God doesn't heal them so that Peter and John would get the honor, so that Peter and John will be remembered into the 21st century. And guess what? They are still remembered. But that's not why God healed them. That was a side effect of it. God heals this man for the simple reason that he could get the glory. And that is the first reason, right? The primary purpose of every revival is to bring glory and praise to God's name. It was not about Peter. It was not about John. And even if they were killed there, the story of the church wouldn't have stopped because it wasn't dependent on Peter and John. It was dependent on God. So God's primary reason is, I want the glory. God is the creator of everything. Jesus is the Savior. Like no one else deserves the glory more than He does. But a lot of us pray for revival, and I've been part of that group because I'm like, Jesus, I'm so tired of, of lukewarm church. Won't you just turn it around? Won't you just change everything? Won't you just make fire in your church again? And although those changes... Although that passion for Jesus, although the difference that the church makes in the world is a result of revival, it is not the main purpose of revival. And if we are praying after these first two weeks, if you're excited, you've listened to some of the stories of revival, and you're like, I want to see that happen in the church, and you are praying for revival because you want to see that happen in the church, or you want to see that happen in your life, then we might have fallen prey to the age-old problem of self-centered interest, where, I'm not actually care, where I don't actually care about what God wants to do, but I actually only care about what's going to happen in my own life, or how I'm going to be remembered. And I want to tell you today, I want to tell you something that might rock your world into its foundations. But our primary purpose of being in this world, in this church, is not to enjoy ourselves, but to glorify God. I'm like, no, Lee, life is about being enjoyed. The Westminster Shorter Catechism years ago the author's question, what is the chief end of man? This was the most simple answer they could come up with, to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. You see, any pursuit of pleasure, of happiness, of all of that, apart from God, is a violation of His purpose, of your creation. It's not according to His design. You weren't made to live for yourself. We were made to live for God. And that is why you can do every single ride at what is it, Canada Wonderland, that, that fills you with adrenaline. You can buy everything you can on Amazon. You can work and achieve more success than you've ever thought. You can pursue all the pleasure, all the happiness that you think you will achieve in life, and still you will feel empty, still you will feel broken, still you will feel without a purpose, because God's design for you was not to live for your own pleasure. God's design for you was not to sit in the church every Sunday and be fed by such a good message with your head growing really big. 
God's design for you was to pursue Him with everything, to glorify Him and to enjoy Him forever. God's glory is the goal. Enjoyment is just the result. It's just the added bonus that God spoils us with. This man, 40 years, he couldn't walk. He was seen as a nothing in his community. The only thing he was good for was to sit outside the temple and beg for money. God transforms his life, but the thing he does is he doesn't go and run a marathon because for 40 years he was sitting. He doesn't go and and just run up and down because he's got his legs back and he's like, I'm going to enjoy my legs so much. We read in Acts 3 verse 8, if you go back a chapter, that he was walking and jumping. But he wasn't just walking and jumping and he was praising God. He was walking and jumping to praise God because what happened in his life was not just for his own pleasure. He found purpose and meaning that he never had before. Not because he found his legs, but because he found his creator and his savior. I want to tell you today, I believe the greatest need of the church today is to put God's interest first and all other interests second. Peter and John is, is facing these religious leaders. And they're like, you guys need to stop talking about Jesus or we're going to kill you. They just saw the Lord being flogged and being crucified. They all ran away, by the way. Peter was initially the brave one who took out a sword and chopped off someone's ear, right? Then Jesus healed it and then he ran away. And then the cherry on the cake, he denies Jesus three times and says, like, I don't know this man. But all of the disciples ran away when the Lord was crucified. This is still a very real image in their head. This happens just a couple of days, a couple, maybe two months or so after Pentecost. They knew What could happen to them if they disobeyed these leaders? They saw it happening to Jesus. But Peter, instead of running away this time, Peter, instead of denying Jesus, they didn't just do it once, but they did it three times. Instead of running away, instead of chopping off ears, instead of denying Jesus, he challenges the same people who crucified Jesus. And I'm like, how does that happen that a man goes from being so scared that he's like, after Jesus warned him he's going to deny him, he still does it, to suddenly, with all boldness, tell them that I cannot stay quiet of what I've seen and heard. I want to tell you, I believe that is the second reason why God sends revival is to restore his church to what it was supposed to be. The history of the church is one of ups and downs. I spoke about that in the beginning, right? That was the, his, that was the story of Peter's life. Like this guy wasn't the perfect disciple. Yes, Jesus said, on you I will build my church. But Peter was the same guy that Jesus said, Satan, get away from me. Peter was the same guy who denied Jesus. Peter was the same guy who often didn't get what Jesus was saying and had to ask for extra explanation. And his own life was up and down. He was the... Only guy who was brave enough when he saw Jesus walking on water to step out of the boat onto the water to walk on it himself. But he was also the same guy who then sank because he lost his trust in Jesus. Fifty years after Pentecost, all of these amazing things that we've been reading about has been happening. And about 50 years after Pentecost, the church began to lapse into lukewarmness. We read about that in the book of Revelations, where God talks to his church, and I'm like, I'm so tired of you guys being lukewarm. And I'm like, why does the church fall into periods of lukewarmness? Why can't we just always be passionate? Why can't we just always be excited? Why can't we always be on fire for Jesus? Why can't we always make a difference in this community? And I want to tell you it's simple. It's the waywardness of the human heart. That's why we go through these ups and downs. You see, because our human condition is one that even the most spiritual person alive can allow their hearts to be turned away from God towards their self-interest. Things like materialism, consumerism, humanism, doing things just for the sake of doing good, buying things just for the hope that I will feel better. 
earning money and gaining more power at work just to hope that I will finally figure out my purpose. We all get distracted and our hearts drift away. And the problem is our human hearts are so stubborn. And I am a stubborn person, so I know when I speak of this. But our hearts are so stubborn, it is so willful, that the normal ministries of the church cannot move us. We can preach about making ourselves the idols of our own lives, and we can preach about having passion for God, and we can preach about all of these things till we are blue. But the reality is that we are so stubborn that normal ministries will never move us. The only one who can is Jesus. I'm not hoping through the best messages to convert anyone to Christianity because I don't have it in me. But God is the one who can. He can speak to parts of your life that I can never speak to. He can bring things to light in your life that you have never thought about. And this is why God sends revival, because I believe God sends revival to return His church, which is called the Bride of Christ. He sends revival to return His church to a state of passion for a groom. I remember when I asked Yolandi to get married, it was on our one-year anniversary, and um, I took her to these gardens in Pretoria that overlooked the city at our union buildings. And um, when that clock hit 12, I gave her the ring. So this was Sunday morning, like early Sunday morning. So we went back to my parents' place. The next morning, we go into church, and we were walking through the church. And this is Yolanda's hand. I'm like, what? That hand is like a life of its own, right? There is so much excitement. So much passion when we are in love. And sadly, we lose that passion for our, bro- for our groom, for Jesus. And to a large extent, I think we have lost it in the Western world. And God sends revival because He wants us to be passionate about Jesus again. Peter standing in front of these people, knowing that if he says one wrong word, they might kill him just like they killed Jesus, tells them in verse 20, listen, you can do whatever you want, but I cannot help it. Like even if I gave it my best shot, I cannot stop speaking about this Jesus. I cannot stop sharing about what I've seen and what I've heard. I didn't hear it secondhand from someone else. I saw it firsthand. I touched Jesus after he was resurrected. I have no confusion about it. My heart is so on fire that I cannot help but speak of him. That's passion. I've told you about the revival that spread to South Africa. After the Lemons Prayer Revival in New York in 1860, revival broke out in South Africa. And back then, they've only had five churches operating there that the Dutch East Indian Company planted or started. All of the ministers had to be imported. Most people didn't have access to it. Afrikaans, my language, was seen as inferior, so people couldn't even worship God in their new own language. And there was this desperate shortage for pastors. When the British took over, they had to bring pastors in from Scotland because there was no one who wanted to take up the job in South Africa. 1860, in the revi- 1860, the revival broke out. And in that first year, over 50 young men came forward to be trained for ministry. It was five churches before that. And 50 young men is like, we are so on fire for Jesus that we cannot remain where we are any longer. The ministry vision of the Dutch Reformed Church back then was the only church in South Africa exploded where previously they were opposed to missions. Suddenly, they were establishing mission stations not only from Cape Town in the south, but all the way up to Nigeria and Sudan. Revival came to the rest of Africa because it started at the southern tip of Africa. By 1927, so a couple of years later, the missions committee of the Cape Dutch Reformed Church recorded 304 serving missionaries from a church that was opposed to sending missionaries. The 304 missionaries, they baptized 72,000 African Christians. 
They established 1,447 schools with 2,700 teachers and 100,000 pupils. You can go all over the world and you will find schools and you will find hospitals and you will find organizations that take care of people who is not capable of doing it themselves. And most of them were started by churches, by people that were so on fire for Jesus that they couldn't keep it from, for themselves. So they had to find any way possible to help other people and help them find Jesus. Peter was a hard-headed dude, and these people realized they can't do anything, probably except for cutting off his head or crucifying him in order to just stay quiet about this Jesus. But it's interesting that they can't. In verse 16, they said, we cannot do anything bad to these people because everyone in Jerusalem knows about this man that was healed, knows that God is working through these people, and we cannot deny it. They're like, if we do something, these people might rebel against us because they are going to say we stopped the work of God. And if you go forward one chapter to Acts 5, verse 35, Gamaliel, one of the, um, one of the leaders, comes to them and tells them the story of two people that also came up as spiritual leaders. They had a following of 100 people or so. They died. The whole thing died with them. And then he gives them these interesting words. He's like, let these guys go because if it is from themselves, it will all just die out. But if it is not, this is what he wants the Jewish leaders. With. He says, then you might be working against God himself. So something is happening in these lives of these religious leaders that crucified Jesus they're like, maybe, maybe there's some truth to what these guys are saying. Maybe we got it wrong. Maybe we're starting to work against the God that we thought we were serving. And in verse 40, we read in, in Acts 5, verse 40, that his speech persuaded them. And I want to tell you the third reason why I believe God sends revival is to capture the attention of the unbelieving world. These people didn't believe, but something changed. And at this point, they're still not believing. Later, we read that a lot of them came to faith. At this point, they don't necessarily believe, but it doesn't matter. Something captured their attention. They are starting to wonder if they got it wrong. The world had to sit up and take notice of what was going on. It wasn't just 12 followers of Jesus anymore. I want to tell you, in the world that we're living, our world hardly recognizes the presence of the church. I challenge you with this last week. I said, what if this building disappears tomorrow? Will people even miss Grace Church? And I believe the world hardly recognizes the presence of the church anymore. The church is often seen as a relic of the past, as archaic, as ineffectual. And I don't believe it's because the Bible is irrelevant I want to say this simply, humans are stupid enough that we make the same mistakes over and over. So we still need God to help us because we don't learn from our mistakes, right? So the Bible isn't irrelevant. We still have an incredible need for a Savior. We still have an incredible need to know our Creator. That doesn't change. But for some reason, the world thinks that we are a relic of the past. And when you watch TV... You can go and watch any new movie. If there's anyone religious and specifically portrayed as Christian religious, it's normally in a very negative sense. This is why, sadly, the world projects the weakness and the mistakes and the inadequacies of the church. And remember, the church is not a building. The Bible says that we are the church. So sadly, the world projects the weakness, the mistakes, and the inadequacies, inadequacies of me and of you onto God. One of the biggest churches in Canada, the pastor, were arrested for sexual assault. Well, there we go again. And the world's going to say, that's what all pastors are like. I'm like, and it's not. But the world projects it onto God. They think that is the way God is. That is the way. If he trusted us with this message, then clearly that's the way God must be if his church is like that. So God sends revival because he cannot allow that to continue. Selwyn Hughes says that revival changes all of that. It changes that wrong perspective of the world. It puts God right in the middle of his people. 
Revival puts God in the middle of grace, church, giving them a voice so powerful that when the church speaks, the world sits up and sits up and listens. After the layman's prayer revival began in New York in 1857, with one man just saying, like, we need to start a prayer meeting, and six people showing up to the first, ma- first meeting. That's where it started. After that, it spread to Wales, to Scotland, to Ireland, to England, to Germany, the Netherlands, India, Indonesia, West Indies, and South Africa. Because of the work That happened in those countries, what God was doing there, it spread throughout the world. You see, first the church sat up and noticed that something was going on. South Africa, Andrew Murray was like, listen, what is going on in New York and all these other places? Why aren't we seeing it in South Africa? So they had a conference with 375 ministers got together, or people that served in the church got together, just to talk about revival, started praying about revival, and things changed. First, the church set up and they, take note, they took notice, and then the world took notice of what was going on. No one could deny, just like they couldn't deny what was happening in the life of this man that was lame for 40 years, the world couldn't deny what was happening. See, God sends revival, thirdly, in order to capture the attention of a world still far from Him. A world still separated from Him. In his book, Selwyn Hughes, his grandparents were in the Wales Revival. So although he didn't experience it himself, he was one of those privileged few who could listen to preachers who got converted to Christianity during times of revival. And he says as a young man, he remembers a preacher that he listened to that was converted in the 1904 Welsh Revival. And this is the story. The preacher said in church that he was a drunkard and a down and out. Back in his youth days. And one night he was sitting in a pub and he was having a drink. And someone came in and said that some strange things are going on at the church down the road. They said people are crying and people are lying on the floor and they don't know what is going on. So he said that my friends and I went down to the church to scoff and have some fun. These silly Christian people. He says, but when I entered the door, it was as if I had been arrested. I sobered up immediately. I fell to my knees, calling upon God to have mercy on my soul. He said, I went to scoff, but I stayed to pray. See, God doesn't send revival for our amazement, just for our enjoyment. He sends revival because it's about His glory that we have forgotten about. And in the process, the church is healed and the world is changed. So if we want to pray for revival, we need to check our own hearts and say, why are we truly after it? Because we want to We want to be remembered through the ages on the page of a book. Because I want to see God doing miracles through me. Because I'm tired of His church being lukewarm. Or is it because I truly believe that there is nothing better but for the world to know God. And to glorify Him and to enjoy Him forever. Let's pray. Jesus, we know that your church and this world is in desperate need for revival. I know that I'm in desperate need for revival. I don't have to go far to see how so many times my focus has been moved away from you onto all kinds of little things that doesn't fulfill me. It's not hard to see that the church 
has grown into a relic of the past in Canada. But we know, God, that all of this can turn around so easily when people truly see you for who you are. And I pray, Jesus, that you will reveal your holiness, your beauty, and your splendor to us in such a way that we would stand in awe, that we would give you all the glory, that our lives would be filled with enjoyment because we know the one who created us for purpose, the one who saved us from ourselves and from the brokenness in this world, from the plans of the enemy. God sent revival. May this world set up and take notice. May you become the center as you once were. May you become the center of this community again. We love you, Jesus. Amen.